Our next guest is Melinda Goldstein, the Chief Marketing Officer for Hain Celestial, a global organic and natural products company. After more than 15 years of consumer packaged goods experience across companies like Unilever, Mars Chocolate, and Mondelez, Melinda took the leap to run marketing and sales for an emerging food brand fairly recently. She's known for understanding the human connection required for building brand love, as well as the strategies and tactics that drive business results. Welcome, Melinda. Hi, thanks so much. I'm Hi, so Melinda, excited how are you? to be here. Very excited to be here. I think it's so cool what you're doing with this series. I watched some of the episodes and I think it's just an awesome way to get people together during this crazy time. So excited always, to be here. Yeah, we always think like, why not karma, right? Like why not, you know, I obviously I have a very large audience of aspiring marketers. So this to them is like, I mean, I've gotten literally hundreds of emails of I'm learning more from marketing from the now than I am in my classroom that I'm paying a lot of money for. And so thank you. And then obviously friendships are made, you know, uh, it's always fun to watch like Ed's still in the back room, watch it like relationships. <laughs> like It's really nice. It's really nice. And thank you for saying that Melinda, before we actually get into you and then back into the business, I think a lot of times when we mention holding companies or the names of a corporation, people don't. So I think just for five seconds on the Hain side, what are some of the brands within it? Because that might give some context for the individuals watching. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, people always say to me when I've said, oh, I'm taking a job with Hain Celestial. They're like, oh, I don't know what that is. And then I tell them, oh, we have Terra chips and Sensible Portions Garden Veggie Straws and um, some personal care brands like Alba, which you may have used for Sun, um, Earth's Best Baby Food. A lot of people know that, one of the first organic baby foods. So those are just kind of a sampling, but we have, you know, probably uh, another you know, five to 10 that most people would know uh, across all of these food and personal care categories. So really great brands. And part of what we're gonna try to do is get more people to know about these brands and a uh, really cool transformation journey that we're on to get there, so. Yeah, but the, you know, to your point, I can, I definitely know that all your millennial moms with young children really know the brands that, you know, uh, you're talking about. So kudos on that portfolio. So what about your career journey? Because again, as I just mentioned earlier, the, the audience here runs the gamut of CEOs of Fortune 50 companies to, you know, sophomores uh, in, in, at art school at an agency or people that want to be brand managers that are at MBAs right now. What, what was your journey and, and how did you stumble into it? Or was it extremely much the focus of, you know, 16-year-old Melinda to eventually get into brand marketing? Yeah, so it, funny, it was definitely not the uh, the first place that I went to. I actually started out in finance and accounting, which most people look at me and are like, you were an accountant, you were a CPA, I don't understand, I don't I don't see it. I'm like, yeah, I didn't see it either. That's why I didn't spend a lot of time there. So, you know, about three or four years, and then I said, okay, this is not for me. Um, and I, I did go back to uh, get an MBA and, and went into marketing. And I think it was great because, you know, as Andrea said in the upfront, you know, I really am about human connections and really the insights and motivations that drive people. And when you put that together with the business side, which I had so much background in on, on finance, it just made a lot of sense for me that brand management was a really strong place that I could play. And I always did want to be in food from the time that I, I started looking into brand management. It's just, to me, it's so much an integral part of our lives. It's emotional, it's physical. Look at it right now during COVID and, and how much of an important factor it is in, in the way people are thinking about their behaviors and, and the dynamics that are changing. A lot of it is you know, related to how they shop for and how they're consuming food and where they're consuming it. Um, so it's just so interesting. And I, I still learn about it and, and have just these moments of ahas every day about how people are thinking about food. So I started with um, Mondelez before it was actually Mondelez. So it was, it was Kraft. Um, and, you know, I've been in big multinational, multi-billion dollar food companies, CPG companies for most of my career. And you know, I will say I've learned a ton in those companies. So, I, you know, I don't have any regrets about spending most of my career in large companies, both from the context of learning what people will say classical CPG training is. So working with some big budgets and iconic brands and also working on some challenger brands and learning from great leaders and mentors and team members and having resources and training and you know, let's, give a, let's, give a, let's give a little love at Kraft early on. Who were one or two kind of mentors that kind of you really looked up to or eventually got to work with? Anybody stand out in those early days? Yeah, gosh, that's a good question. So, um, you know, I, I was at Kraft for a relatively short period of time. I would got say uh, one of my directors um, was Andrew Burke, 
who uh, went on to lead some other companies and, and he, he had some interesting comments that I, I would always bring up of, you know, perception is reality, right? Whether it's your personal career or consumers, you know, maybe tr one thing may be true about you or maybe true about your brand, but if people don't perceive it that way, it actually doesn't matter. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of one person that comes to mind right away. But, um, you know, I'll also say I learned a lot in these big companies about what I don't want to do and how I don't want to lead going forward. So, you know, the way we can sometimes talk ourselves into something because we're comfortable with it instead right. of, you know, the things that we probably are uncomfortable with are the places we need to be pushing in many cases to get the breakthrough and the remarkability and talkability that we need on our brand. So um, I think I learned a lot there. And, you know, I kind of then made the leap to go work for uh, an emerging uh, startup food brand which was really hard and, and risky for me to do. And I think it was probably the, the, the most, um, you know, momentous change in my career in the way that I thought about um, my, my brands and my business and also just personally, the way that I kind of approach things in that it's really easy to just stay in your lane in a large company and not get the context of everything that's going on and, you know, almost kind of step out and say, well, this isn't my job, but I'm going to do it anyway, or I'm going to learn about it anyway, because it's going to make me a better marketer and a better business person. And in some ways, I wish I had known that earlier in my career. I probably would have been, you know, <laughs> learning things in these big companies that I didn't know. And I, I encourage anyone, whether you're in a big company or a small company, get to know everything you can about every function beyond marketing, if you're a marketer, uh, because it will make you stronger. It'll, it'll make you think about the business differently and, and think about consumers differently. It's a really, yeah, it's a really powerful point, having the context point. You know, a lot of people struggle I'm very Renaissance man. Like I've got my, you know, little vibes in almost everything. And I, and I have some really fun late night conversations with really bright and brilliant people around the notion of width versus depth. And I've always been a huge fan of extreme narrow depth in something that you enjoy and end up being good at, complemented by extraordinary width because you need the context to make your depth so much stronger. And as you were talking, that's what kind of, you know, that's what I heard, which is like, you're going to be a marketer and you need to know it. But if you actually have empathy to why Toys R Us or ShopRite does that, or why your sales team is pushing back on you because they have to hit their quotas this month and they don't care about your new innovation, their client's just going to buy this thing and they'll hit it. Like if you understand, well, then all of a sudden you can be better at your deep thing. Yeah, exactly. Or where operationally you're going to run into issues, you know, anticipate those and have those conversations up front. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, not, you know, for me, to some extent, we're, we're, we're accelerators, we're type A and early in your career, especially, you're a little bit afraid to acknowledge the things that you don't know. So again, it's sure. great because you can focus on the things you know, and you can be a superstar there and you'll, you know, keep moving up the line. But again, if you can, if you can have the courage to just admit, hey, I'm not really familiar with this area. Tell me a little bit more about it. Or this is something that, you know, I think would be interesting. Uh, you know, can really help you, can help you in the now. And it can also help you, you know, as you go forward in your career. And like I said, I think being at a startup really crystallized that for me because you have to kind of thrown into it. But it's great because now at, at Hain, you know, I'm, I'm very much uh, talking to everybody, getting involved in things that I probably wouldn't have in the past. And you know, inserting myself into conversations or areas that aren't technically my job, but that, again, make me, make me a better business person and, and make me better at, you know, marketing our brands at the end of the day. Well, you started at Hain when again? It was the end of April. So just over four months now. Right. So Feels like a long time. So talk to me about, because I think there's some people, again, thinking about the broadness of the audience, maybe some people that are struggling and or excelling in their new jobs that happened let's say from January on, right? They either had just started in a new company, boom, COVID. Some people literally like within that March one and then 13 days later, and then other people joined companies post COVID. You know, uh, how is it leading? Cause you go into this huge leadership role. How is it leading remotely? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely awkward at first because <laughs> it's not, you know, we're not familiar with it. I mean, yeah. I. I interviewed in person with just a couple of people in the office the day before everything shut down. And wow. then I had another round of interviews virtually and started virtually. And so, you know, I'm, I'm leading and, and yeah, you have to manage up, you have to manage across, you have a new team of people, a lot of people. And I'm, I'm a social animal. I've never had to work at building relationships. And this is probably the first time that I actually had to mentally prepare, carve out time, 
you know, think about how I'm actually going to build relationships because right, the because business you part. What you want on serendipity, walking the halls. Oh, I haven't seen Carol in a while. Let me go have a coffee with her for six minutes. Da, 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 da. Even something you said earlier, I wanted to jump in, but I'm trying not to interrupt. You know, knowing where roadblocks are. So many of you that are on this program have figured out how to build constituents. It's really like politics. You're, you're learning how to, hey, I know Carl is gonna try to stop me. Let me go eat lunch with Carl for a month and become friends, which will at least give me a prayer to make my, that's real life. That's real right. life. And that's hard to do remotely, right? So it's not the getting things done, the business part of it's actually really easy remotely. You can kind of slide right into that, but the, the personal relationships, they're harder. And you know, like I said, I had to carve out time. And one of my first meetings with uh, my full team that was reporting to me uh, somebody's cat walked by, you know, on the, on the screen. And I said, oh, you know, I love this when, when I see people's pets and who has pets. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of time. We had other stuff we had to talk about, but we spent, you know, 10 minutes at least with people sharing pictures and bringing their cats and dogs into the room and everyone kind of lit up. And it was the moment where, you know, it felt like you were actually starting to get to know who they were instead of just, all right, let's just have, you know, check these five things off the list and get off the call. And it, it did make a difference. You know, people did talk differently both amongst themselves and the, and the team and with me after that. So you just kind of have to be human a little bit to, to build those relationships, but you have to think about it remotely again, which I think is different. I love that. Talk to me about, um, we haven't touched on e-commerce a whole lot in today's yeah. world, and I know that's a, a passion point. Uh, so here in the last three or four minutes, your, the approach, how you see the landscape, the opportunities, the pitfalls, you know, what, what are your thoughts across the board on that? Yeah, I mean, I can say that um, Hain has actually been working on, on a lot in the e-commerce space, both kind of supply chain and media and assortment um, before I started for probably a good 12 to 24 months. So, so it was nice to come in and feel like things were already in place and not have to scramble to, to get things going. But, you know, the biggest aha, I would say, is I remember being at Unilever not that long ago and Omnichannel was like a buzzword, right? We had a, we had a checklist of things we had to do for Omnichannel and everyone's like, all right, I got to do my Omnichannel checklist. But it wasn't really embedded in the way that we were thinking about, you know, approaching um, kind of the world. And now you have to. It's a burning platform. Everybody, Omnichannel is not a buzzword anymore. It's a reality. And we have to think about it that way. Retailers are thinking, thinking about it that way. You know, we are building it into the way that we go through customer business planning. It has to be part of what you're thinking about when you're launching a new product. So, you know, it's, it's a totally different world than it was even just a couple of years ago. And um, I think the other part of that is, you know, we're doing trainings and things like that because mostly because we have to have a consistent language in the way that we talk about it across different areas of the company. But it's not like a, you know, a one training and you walk away, just dump it and everyone can kind of use it. It's really just continuous learning. And we're all learning about this every day. It's, it's changing on the fly as we are, you know, as we're moving forward here day to day. So, you know, we have to admit that we're all new to it. It's not like I'm the omni-channel expert. There's no one person in the organization you can go to anymore that that's your expert. We're, we're all responsible for it. We all own it. And, and it is, it's, it's the strategy. It's the reality. It's, it's no more a buzzword. So, um, you know, if you don't do that, you're not going to be successful. And, and I think that's something that, you know, our, our competitors are certainly going to be doing our retailers and suppliers are doing. And so uh, it's important for us and, and we're, we're embracing it and, and living it across the organization. And do you think there's more buy-in because of COVID? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it definitely accelerated, you know, every metric, especially for food, right? Food kind of online grocery was really struggling in the past and, and it kind of skyrocketed as a really important area. So um, I think, you know, as you said, buy-in, you know, when you think about leadership where it might not have been people's focus, now all of a sudden it's, well, what are you doing in, in e-commerce sure. and omni-channel? And it's funny because there are people in our organization who are like, wow, we've been doing this for 12 months and finally people are noticing. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's an interesting yeah. dynamic, but it's not going away. It's, it's definitely the future of how we need to think about this. Humans will buy food on the internet. That is correct. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to be here.